Hi everyone, this is Jamila Siddiqui with the Design Lab and today I'm going to talk to you about some design principles to keep in mind as you build your infographics. At the Design Lab we work from a cat model of what gets to count as effective design. And we don't mean the cute furry cat, what we mean is how are you thinking about your concept or in other words the main idea you want to communicate and to the audience that you want to communicate it to and how that is helped or not by your aesthetic decisions. So things like font or color or placement on a page or whether you use an image or a picture or a photo. Um, all of those are aesthetic choices that can either support or hinder the effectiveness of your main idea being communicated to your audience. We also will touch a little bit on how you are using the software tools technically to support the good execution of building a infographic that considers aesthetic elements um, and how they are communicating main ideas. So let's get started with the concept of infographics. First and foremost, what is an infographic? It's any imaging of data or information designed to tell a visually pleasing story. So basically what we're talking about here is taking a bunch of information that would have been presented in text, maybe paragraphs, sentences, maybe in tables, and turning it into something visual. For example, something like this. This is an infographic that lets you know how much caffeine is in a cup of coffee. Artist Lokesh Dakar designed this and it's very helpful for the viewer who wants to, for example, get a really strong hit of caffeine, maybe by going to Death Wish Coffee. We can learn that really quickly through this graphic rather than reading this information, for example, in a table. So that brings us to why would we make an infographic? There are two main reasons. First, infographics highlight the most important information. Rather than overwhelming your viewer with a lot, whether it be a lot of text or just a lot of points, when you build an infographic, you're forced to pick which pieces of information are most important to present. And secondly, that information is more likely to be retained when it's paired with pictures. Lots of research has been done on this, and it shows consistently that um, your audience will remember what you are presenting to them much more easily when it's in picture form or connected to a picture form of some sort. So what kind of infographic might you be making? Um, it might be helpful to kind of keep all of these possibilities in mind, so let's step through them. You might be making your infographic simple. Uh, simple infographics have a single piece of information or maybe it's sort of like an icon that you might find on a sign like this radioactive symbol here. And they convey information really quickly and concisely and it's just one single piece of information. In dangerous or life-threatening situations that's really important because you need to communicate really succinctly um, so that the point is understandable right away. You might make your infographic long, on the other hand, if you have a lot of information to communicate and you have the space to do so. So for example, this long form infographic style is one that's designed for scrolling. So if your infographic is going to a web page or maybe being posted on a social media site, um, maybe it's going into an email newsletter where we can scroll, that affords you more space to fill up if you have a lot of information. Um, you might also have lots of pieces of information to display because there's a relationship between them and you need to demonstrate the whole relationship. So infographics can be really long and they don't have to be just short or simple or long. They can come in between. There's lots of variations in between. Here we have a singular infographic and you might be designing a singular infographic that is just one unit of information when you're trying to convey just a single idea or have a single set of data. Um, you might also use this if you want to focus your audience on a small bit of information and not overwhelm them. Or maybe when they need to learn something really quickly e or easily, maybe in passing, like 
on a flyer that's going to be up on a wall. You need to capture their attention and just get one point across, not overwhelm them with a bunch of things that they have to read. Or maybe this is in an Instagram post or some other kind of social media post. So singular infographics are just one unit of information, whereas composite infographics have multiple units of information. Here we have an infographic on infographics. It's data about building infographics. And there's lots of different um, pieces of information about infographics that we learn here. It is grouped into two subcategories, design and content, so we get to see some themes um, as there is a lot on this page to, to really digest. That's helpful to have it grouped into themes. Um, and there might be, in this case there isn't, but there might be an order to your pieces of information when you're building a composite infographic. Here, these pieces can pretty much be moved around and you'll still get the same meaning out of it. You might also have data that is quantitative that you're trying to represent. Quantitative data includes numbers and statistics, often representing things like proportions and levels and frequencies and averages. Um, so for example, this infographic from Grant Thornton uses statistical data paired with the corresponding color and scale to convey the percentage of women in the boardroom globally. Numbers lend well to these sorts of comparisons, but you don't have to have numbers to build an infographic. You can also have qualitative data, which is more descriptive. Um, so for example, this infographic is not displaying proportions or frequencies, rather just informative lists that are grouped into subcategories to convey the nutrition of blue and purple colored foods. It still works just as well. It's still an infographic, but it doesn't have numbers behind it. Instead, it's, it's informative and descriptive concepts. You might design an infographic that is what we would call categorical, meaning that it has groups of information that can stand on their own as individual units, and that can be displayed in any order, and they're not dependent on each other. So this is almost like if you think of a deck of tarot cards, you can shuffle them in any order and display them in any order and still get meaning out of them. Um, this allows you the greatest range of flexibility in your design if you don't have to present pieces of information in a particular order or in connection to each other. Um, so keep that in mind, that categorical infographics allow that flexibility. You might also be designing an infographic that compares two different things. Here we have a comparison of two different terrains or maps pre-industrial versus modern in terms of the aquatic methane emissions. Um, this was actually created here at UW-Madison. You don't necessarily have to compare visual or graphical elements. You could also have a comparison of words or lists running down side by side, but what we're doing here is allowing that side by side presentation to let the eye see what are some similarities and differences between two different categories. Similar to what we just looked at, your infographic might be a map as well. Um, this is most likely to happen when you want to capture and represent the terrain or elements of a particular object or space, like for example beard growth on this infographic um, that is technically a map. It's a map of someone's face and how their beard might grow. Here's another example of something that you might not think of as a map, but it kind of is. Um, this is a diagram of how chai is made and everything that it is composed of. Notice how it's not just a recipe for chai, it's not just a list of what is in that cup of chai, but it's graphically represented. We see images of all the different components and each component is labeled. That word is next to that image. Your infographic might have visual elements that are demonstrating a sequence. Um, such as what we have here, a decision tree that conveys the steps that somebody might take to make a sequence of decisions. 
So starting at the top and then looking at each node and the node being an image as well as some text. So for example, we have the bat and it says my house is basically a bat cave. That's a node. Uh, and then we follow the arrows and the lines to make our decision. This is a visual representation of a decision process. You might also see a similar format used in flowcharts or process diagrams that shows each step as an individual element on the page and in the order that it needs to be taken. Uh, and usually there's some lines and arrows directing you through that order as well. If what you want to emphasize is a chronological sequence, you might be designing a timeline infographic like this one that maps the key milestones of Elon Musk's progress through life. Um, it's actually mapped in two different ways. So at the top we have almost like a clock timeline and then towards the bottom we start to see an actual line that marks key milestones with both a graphic as well as a brief descriptive text. Timelines can also look like this. Um, this is an entirely different design. And here it's delineating key time periods of video game history and the shifts that happen between each period. So notice how the design choices here allow us to communicate uh, a little bit of a different uh, view of this chronological information. Here we're focusing more on what are the groups of time periods and how do they compare Whereas here, it's more of there are individual things that happened along this person's life. Um, and they're not necessarily grouped. They just come one after another. So that wraps up what we like to think of as the concept of infographics and the range at which you might be thinking about your infographics and the main ideas that you want to communicate to your audience. Let's now look at some aesthetic decisions that you might be making as you begin to actually design and build your infographic. At the Design Lab, we teach you to design crap. Yep, you heard me right. We want you to design crap. Um, clearly, we love our acronyms. So what crap stands for is contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. These are our design principles that will um, help you be successful in making good aesthetic decisions that support the communication of your concept. We're going to walk through each one of these, starting with contrast. Here we have four pieces of information that have no contrast. Everything looks exactly the same. It's the same font, it's the same size, it's the same weight, the same color. But if I told you that some of these were more top-level headers and some of these were more subheader pieces of information. I could change the design to look more like this to communicate that to you. What this does is it tells you to look here first and then at the darker black text and then the regular weight black text. It gives you that sense that there is a hierarchy to this information that I'm presenting to you or some kind of organization to it. And my design choices, in contrast, help communicate that. Contrast also applies to your background. So if you have, for example, a pink background and pink text, the look here kind of fades away a lot. You can't really read it very well. So keep that in mind. Same thing for when you are tempted to use a photo or image in your background behind text. Think twice about that. It's really tricky and really hard to be able to do that. As you can see, the words look at the bottom fade away even into the cat's tie. Um, photos don't give you that consistent background that you can then decide on what color your font needs to be in order for it to contrast. Instead, there's lots of different darks and lights and mid colors, so it's, it's just really hard to get your font to be readable on photos. So be careful with that. Since some folks will not see the hue of color, it's important that there is a strong value contrast, meaning the lightness or darkness of a color. Uh, working on extreme ends of the value spectrum will help increase legibility. So try to stay away from those mid-range colors. Um, this is grayscale, but any uh, color could be turned into a grayscale like this. So just keep that in mind, that 
dark and light are good contrasts, and mid-range can be a little bit of a challenge to contrast with. One last note on color contrast, a lot of people are tempted to use red and green. This is an issue for accessibility because of red-green color blindness, which is a very popular one. These two colors have the same value. You can tell because in grayscale they actually look exactly the same. So somebody who has red-green color blindness would not be able to see that there's two blocks of color on that page. You might need to darken the red and lighten the green to create a little bit more of a contrast there. So keep that in mind for accessibility. So what does contrast look like in an actual infographic? Let's look at this example. We're going to come back to it throughout all of our progression through CRAP. Um, and this is a pretty great one. So are we in the midst of a sixth mass extinction? Here, Bill Marsh from the New York Times, he's the one who made this, is using a lot of contrast in color to draw your eye to what is actually um, a highly threatened species versus not. So for example, we can see flowering plants at the bottom really heavily filled in. Um, we've got 25% of mammals, the red contrast to the black. We can read it pretty quickly. So he's using contrast very effectively here to keep your eye moving where it needs to be. Okay, so that was contrast. Now let's talk about repetition, the R in crap. It might be tempting to throw lots of different colors, shapes, and line weights into your design like this. Um, I see this a lot at the design lab. It feels like it could be really flashy and catchy, but it actually can be really overwhelming to your reader or audience. Here, your eye doesn't really know where to go. There's lots of different things going on, and we can't tell if there's any kind of relationship or organization between these three elements. But instead, I can use a repetition of our main design element at the design lab, our pink hexagon, to create a more cohesive design and communicate to you that there are three of the same kind. So what does this look like? We're talking kind of abstractly right now. What does this look like in real life? Here's an example. So let's say we have these three images and they are representing the same level of information. Uh, you can't really tell that. They're different colors. They're even different image styles. So we've got an illustration, a cartoon, um, also a almost realistic photo, um, different colors, different sizes. I can go back to that hexagon though, that repeating design element, and put those images inside of it, and now you can understand, based on my design choices, that these are three of the same type or level. We can also go a step further, make sure that our images are of the same kind. If they're all illustrations, make them all illustrations. So repetition is important. It also applies to text. It might be very tempting to use a bunch of different typefaces or fonts um, as you are putting together your infographics. We highly encourage you to hold back on that. One to two fonts at the most. It should be all that you need. Here, because the designer has chosen three different colors as well as fonts or typefaces, you're not quite sure as a viewer if these are three different levels, how they relate to each other, if they're all the same. And if they were all the same, I could use repetition in my design styling to communicate that to my viewer. So going back to Bill Marsh's infographic, it uses repetition in icons and color palette and typography or fonts to create a unified design. Uh, this makes it simple to distinguish the key differences between species shape and threatened versus non-threatened species, um, as it's indicated by the same color contrast. Okay, so that was repetition. Moving on to the A in crap or alignment. Um, this is our third principle. When elements are out of a line, like you see on your screen, it is difficult for viewers to interpret the organization of information. However, 
if I were to move these lines all together, here your eye is more directed as to where to go and your brain understands the organization of this information a little bit better. So what does this look like outside of the abstract world? Well, here we have a bunch of pieces of information that are not lined up very well. Um, if we move them over together, it makes a big difference in terms of how you can read this information and where your eye goes. Here your eye is bouncing around and you're not quite sure why something is moved over further than something else that is supposedly the same thing. So if it's the same, keep it aligned the same. Looking at Bill Marsh's piece again, we see he is using a center alignment for the entire design. The text is also center aligned and the arrangement of all the icons lead our eyes to the center of the composition. Uh, and this indicates to us that some important concluding points are in the center. So he's using alignment very intentionally here in his design. All right, last but not least, the P in CRAP stands for proximity. Um, proximity refers to the spatial arrangement of different elements and how they relate to each other based on that spatial arrangement. Um, so when things are in closer proximity, that creates groupings in the mind. So those things could be text or shapes or lines. Here we have all of these lines presented as equally related to each other. They're all in one group. And I can use the principle of proximity to create two groups by adding in some white space between the top two lines and the bottom three lines. So what does this look like outside of the abstract world? Here we have several le levels of headings and it's actually two groups of information, but you can't exactly tell that through the use of proximity in this design. If I move that second group a little bit farther apart and make sure to keep headings um, that identify one group of information closer to each other, then you can see that a little bit more clearly. Here's another example. Unless you were an expert on hedgehogs, you probably wouldn't be able to tell which one's European versus which one's African pygmy. They look very similar. This is an example of poor proximity. If I think about moving the label of the type of hedgehog closer to the picture it represents, that communicates to you as a viewer much more easily and quickly which one is which. So looking once more at Bill Marsh's infographic, he uses the principle of proximity well to both distinguish between species, because there's space between each grouping, and to effectively caption each group by locating the species identification and percentages close to or within the cluster of icons representing it. Okay. So that wraps up our crap. Yes, you should be designing crap. Contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. We are going to move on to the technical aspects of creating an infographic. You most likely will be using one of these three softwares. They are fairly popular and frequently used for building infographics. Canva and PictoChart are web apps, uh, whereas Adobe Illustrator is a piece of software that you would need to have installed on your computer or access it at an InfoLab computer or one that you check out from the library. Canva's strengths are their pre-formatted templates that are very editable, so there are a lot of infographics uh, templates already preloaded into Canva. Um, PictoChart does a really great job of handling numerical data and putting it into captivating visualizations like charts. And Illustrator is really great for those who like to have complete control over every element in their design and who are willing and able to learn the software that has a tremendous amount of features. So it's a very heavy software. So as you move forward with your infographic, don't forget cat crap. It's not the stuff in a stinky litter box. It is thinking about how your aesthetic design uh, decisions 
like how are you using contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity are supporting the communication of your concept to your audience. Thanks so much and have um, a lot of fun building your infographics. Design Lab is here to help you work effectively in digital media. We offer free one-on-one -on -one or small group appointments to provide personalized recommendations and feedback on your projects. We can help you at any point in the creation process. We can help you brainstorm ideas and think through the organization. We can recommend tools, resources, and equipment. And we can be a second set of eyes throughout the creation and editing process. Due to the pandemic, we have suspended all in-person appointments, but we are now offering appointments via video calls. To make an appointment, just go to the Design Lab website and click the pink Make an Appointment button. Have just a quick question or want to drop in and see if someone's available now? Start a chat with us using our new chat service, which is open anytime Design Lab is open. Click Chat with Design Lab in the main menu of the Design Lab website. We look forward to working with you.